I'm going to talk about the changing management of abdominal wounds during the Great War. When you see millions of the mouthless dead across your dreams and pale battalions go, say not soft things to them, as other men have said, that you'll remember, for you need not so. Give them not praise. Being deaf, how should they know it is not curses heaped on each gashed head? Nor tears, their blind eyes see not your tears flow, nor honour, it is easy to be dead. Say only this, they are dead. Then add thereto, yet many a better one has died before. And scanning all the o'ercrowded mass, should you perceive one face that you loved heretofore, it is a spook. None wears the face you knew. Great death has made all his forevermore. This is Brandhook New Military Cemetery near Ypres. The cemetery was opened at the end of July 1917, just before the Third Battle of Ypres began on the 31st of July. The cemetery closed one month later. There are 558 burials in this cemetery, and these burials come from three casualty clearing stations, British 32 and 44, and Australian 3. Now, these three casualty clearing stations dealt exclusively with chest wounds, abdominal wounds, and compound fractures of the femur. And great death made all his, from the soldiers with wounds of the chest, abdomen and femur, who died here at Brandhook during that month. The incidence of a penetrating abdominal wound was reckoned to be 1.92% at advanced dressing stations and 0.72% further back at casualty clearing stations. Now, the difference is perhaps because of deaths which occurred between the advanced dressing station and the casualty clearing station, or perhaps due to an overdiagnosis at advanced dressing stations. I should say a little bit here about the evacuation pathway. The first person to see a wounded soldier was a regimental medical officer in his regimental aid post close to the front line. He had 16 stretcher bearers whose job it was to go out into no man's land and bring the wounded back to the regimental aid post. From there, a field ambulance would assume control of the casualty. Now you may think of an ambulance as a vehicle with a blue flashing light going down Morningside Road. That is merely an ambulance wagon. A field ambulance was a mobile surgical hospital. It had tent sections, and men from the tent sections established an advanced dressing station and a main dressing station to deal with casualties as they were evacuated from the front line. The field ambulance also had stretcher bearer sections, and they pooled resources to help collect the wounded from the regimental aid post and take it back to the advanced dressing station of the field ambulance. From there, they would pass to, a, by motor ambulance convoy, to casualty clearing stations. Now, these were called casualty clearing hospitals in 1914. But, and they were just that. They were to clear the casualties back to the stationary hospitals and general hospitals at the base in Cali, Bologna, Etapla, and so on. But it took far too long to get there. You had to do your surgery before, much, much sooner, because patients were arriving with gas gangrene and horribly infected wounds, and many lost their limbs, if not their lives. Now, casualty clearing stations were far enough away from the front line 
to be generally out of range of shell fire, although not exclusively, as you will see, and close enough that a motor ambulance wagon convoy could get there relatively quickly. And so it was that casualty clearing stations came, became the places where urgent, definitive, life-saving, limb-saving surgery was carried out before the patient was sent by train to the base hospitals. And the static nature of trench warfare on the Western Front led to the casualty clearing stations becoming this location. Now, casualty clearing stations 32, 44, and Australian 3 at Brandhook in 1917 represented major progress in the management of abdominal wounds. They were much closer to the front line than ever before. Patients were transferred quickly from 10 advanced dressing stations a short distance away along the ypres Isère Canal. And because they were transferred early, early surgical intervention was provided for these casualties. And the surgery was carried out by surgeons experienced in the management of abdominal wounds and chest wounds and compound fractures of the femur. As a result of early surgery, the overall mortality went from somewhere over 80% to 60%. It's still pretty high. Now, the other casualty clearing stations were farther back. So you have casualty clearing stations at Dozingham, Bandigem, and Mendingham, names given by the soldiers, and at Remy Siding. The four biggest casualty clearing stations on the Western Front were at Remy Siding near Popperinga. So the emphasis then was on the speed of access to those casualty clearing stations at Brandhook. How different it was in 1914 at the outbreak of the Great War. In 1914, very little had changed in the management of penetrating abdominal wounds since the days of John Hunter in the late 18th century. In 1914, there was no rational surgical intervention for abdominal wounds. Patients with abdominal wounds were treated expectantly for all intents and purposes, they were expected to die. Hunter's treatment for abdominal wounds in the 18th century was a tepid bath in order to supply fluid to the general constitution. And the management in 1914, for practical purposes, was little different. George James Guthrie was perhaps the most prominent British military surgeon in the time of the Peninsular War. And surgery in the 19th century, certainly the first, well, first three quarters really, were focused on wounds of the extremity, which were easily accessible. Surgeons had neither the ability nor the means to deal with penetrating abdominal wounds. Bear in mind that there was no general anaesthesia in the first half of the 19th century. Saves having to sit waiting for your anaesthetist to turn up. Anyway, this is a watercolour painted by Charles Bell. Charles Bell was a Scottish surgeon, Edinburgh based, and he went off to London where he was working in London. When news of the Battle of Waterloo was announced, he said to his brother-in-law, who was also a surgeon, Johnny, we must away to Brussels. This is too good an opportunity to miss. So Charles Bell went off to Brussels where he operated on wounded French soldiers, many of whom had lain on the battlefield of Waterloo for several days. Now, Bell was a gifted artist and he sketched and subsequently painted this soldier with a penetrating abdominal wound. Now, even if the two bits of intestine that are sticking out are not perforated, there's a pretty good chance this soldier will die of peritonitis. 
They didn't all die. Sometimes a bit of bowel would become walled off and you'd get a fecal fistula or something like that, and the patient would survive. But mostly, they died. And to all intents and purposes, there was nothing really could be done. The first demonstration of surgical anesthesia was in 1846 at the Massachusetts General Hospital, using ether as an anesthetic agent. Now, did this result in the progress of the management of abdominal wounds well, certainly not in the Crimean War. The smart of the knife is a powerful stimulant, and it's much better to hear a man bawl lustily than see him sink silently into the grave. So said Sir John Hall. So not much progress in the Crimean War. In the Boer War, expectant management became established. The patient was put in Fowler's position, sort of semi-upright, knees straighter bent, which was ever more comfortable, to relieve tension on the abdominal wall. The casualty was kept warm, no food or drink was given for three days, saline was administered rectally to give them some fluids, and the result was almost invariably fatal. Now, some surgeons did undertake abdominal surgery, and Sir Frederick Treves, who became renowned for removing Edward VII's appendix subsequently, certainly operated on some patients during the Boer War. But the patients usually died. And even if they survived the surgery, they succumbed post-operatively. Now, the consulting surgeon to the British Army, Sir William McCormack, stated fairly categorically, in this war, a man wounded in the abdomen dies if operated upon and remains alive when left in peace. And this philosophy was not helped by two doctors who allegedly survived from penetrating abdominal wounds. Why were abdominal wounds associated with such a high mortality? Well, you've got vital structures in the abdomen, solid structures, spleen, kidney, liver, pancreas, which bleed. And then you've got hollow viscera, bowel, small bowel, large bowel. And the proximity of the abdomen to the chest meant that injuries to the chest and abdomen, combined injuries, were relatively common. Now, the first real progress in the management of abdominal wounds came in the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-05. Vera Gedroitz, seen here on the right, was a surgeon and also was a Lithuanian princess. In this posed photograph, the figure holding on to the plaster here is Tsar Nicholas II's wife, Alexandra. Vera Gedroitz performed her surgery in a Red Cross train close to the front line. She operated on patients early. And Gedroitz had excellent results. Results which either went unnoticed or were ignored in the West. Lessons would have to be relearned during the Great War. And it would be 1915 before the first successful bowel resection was performed a hundred years after Charles Bell did his sketches. This resection was performed by a surgeon called Owen Richards in 1915. The patient was a Canadian Scot wounded in a German trench on the 18th of March 1915. He walked back to his lines, holding on to his intestines. He wanted to die amongst his friends. Instead, he had six bowels, six feet of small bowel resected, and as you can see, it had multiple perforations caused by a shell fragment, and the patient survived. Owen Richard graduated at Guy's Hospital in London, he was professor of surgery at the Egyptian Government School of Medicine. He was already working on bowel resection techniques, joining bowel back together in cows. 
could have picked dogs, but he picked cows. And he was appointed to British Casualty Clearing Station No. 6, which varied in its location. He wrote a paper in 1915 in which he wrote up the results of nine casualties with perforating small bowel wounds. Seven patients died. They had had surgery far too late. Two patients survived. They had had small bowel resection and anastomosis performed six and 18 hours respectively after being wounded. So the timing of surgery was important and it had to be done sufficiently early to improve the chances of success. Owen Richards, of course, was reinventing the wheel. Vera Gedroitz had come to the same conclusion in 1904-05. Sir Cuthbert Wallace was consulting surgeon to the British First Army. And Wallace, too, thought that delays in surgical treatment brought about this very high mortality. And he quoted an 80% mortality. The important thing that he found was that bleeding, bleeding from mesenteric vessels and other vessels, was the principal cause of death in patients dying from abdominal wounds. And he came to this conclusion after careful post-mortem studies. So bleeding was the cause of early death. Quietly, they set their burden down. He tried to grin, moaned, moved his head from side to side. Oh, put my leg down, Dr. Do. He'd got a bullet through the ankle and had been shot horribly in the guts. The surgeon seemed so kind and gentle, saying above the crying, you must keep still, my lad. But he was dying. Late deaths occurring after a couple of days were caused by infection, contamination of the peritoneal cavity by bowel contents resulted in septicemia. There were no antibiotics in 1914. There were no intensive therapy units in 1914, and cases of severe, significant penetrating abdominal wounds with perforated bowels arriving late always died. They drifted away with septicemia and multiple organ failure. His wet white face and miserable eyes brought nurses to him more than groans, and sighs. But hoarse and low and rapid rose and fell his troubled voice. He did the business well. The ward grew dark, but he was still complaining and calling out for Dickie. Oh, curse the wood. It's time to go. Christ. And what's the use? We'll never take it, and it's always raining. I wondered where he'd been, then heard him shout. They snipe like hell, oh Dickie, don't go out. I fell asleep. Next morning, he was dead, and some slight wound lay smiling on the bed. Cuthbert Wallace also reported that Successful outcomes of expectant treatment in the past were unjustified. Most of these cases, he said, had never had perforating bowel wounds. Anthony Bowlby, Sir Anthony Bowlby, was senior advisor to the Director General of Army Medical Services on the Western Front. And the work of Owen Richards and Cuthbert Wallace helped to provide Bowlby with evidence of the importance of early surgical intervention. And by June 1915, the official policy for the management of abdominal wounds was early evacuation and surgery. Now, it wouldn't revolutionize the management of uh, the treatment, but even a 10% reduction in mortality 
would save thousands of lives. John Fraser was an Edinburgh surgeon. And in a series of 300 cases of penetrating abdominal wounds, Fraser demonstrated that with early intervention, the overall mortality was reduced from 80% to 60%. He published his work in the British Medical Journal. Now, Fraser was actually an outstanding chap on the Western Front. Not only was he a very capable surgeon, he was also on the shock committee for the Medical Research Committee. It wasn't renamed the Medical Research Council till the early 1920s. And he was awarded a military cross after being wounded in the front line near Lewes for measuring the blood pressure of soldiers under combat conditions. And in this photograph here, he's wearing his military cross ribbon. Surgical audit is an everyday thing of surgical practice in 2015. But surgical audit was also performed during the Great War. It was noted that there were different outcomes at different casualty clearing stations with similar types of wound. The time from sustaining the wound to reaching the casualty clearing station constantly emerged as the most important factor. Six to ten hours after being wounded gave the best chance of survival. Twelve to twenty-four hours, less chance. More than twenty-four hours, very little chance of surviving. And after thirty-six hours, they all died. The pulse rate was important. 100 to 120 gave a pretty good chance of survival, but more than 120, very poor chance. Simple, uh, documented parameters, clinical parameters, in establishing the prognosis. Nothing fancy. Type of projectile was important. Wounds from fragments of grenades resulted in a lower mortality than wounds caused... Oh, I'll just say it again than wounds caused by bits of shrapnel or bullet. Uh, the Mills bomb was uh, devised by William Mills, who was born in Sunderland. He, by occupation, he was a marine engineer, and his factory made golf clubs. In 1915, he turned his hand to the making of hand grenades, and 70 million were thrown. Uh, Mills bombs, that is, not golf clubs. And he was knighted in 1922 for his contribution. Bits of uh, shrapnel, bits of exploding shell, cause a higher mortality. And bullets caused a higher mortality. But here's a soldier who survived a penetrating abdominal wound from a three-ounce shell fragment. He had a double resection of bowel, and this photograph was taken 20 years later. This comes from a book by Gordon Gordon Taylor, the Abdominal Injuries of Warfare, written just before the outbreak of the Great War, Part II, in 1939. The position of the wound was very important. Wounds of the upper abdomen did better. Below the abdomen had a worse prognosis, because wounds of the lower abdomen had more bowel involvement. Incidentally, my wife took this photograph of me on the beach in Aberdeen <laughs> last summer. <laughs> believe that, you'll believe anything, I tell you. Wounds of the buttock were particularly bad. They were frequently complicated by wounds of the abdominal or pelvic viscera. So wounds involving the buttock were always sent to casualty clearing stations where the expertise was available to deal with abdominal wounds. And of course, since there was so much muscle and so much space for bits of shrapnel to get lost in, gas gangrene was common in buttock wounds as well. So wounds in the buttock were bad news. The organ damage was an important factor in dictating the prognosis. And this again is work of John Fraser. And you can see the mortality of different wounds, stomach, small intestine, large intestine. Rectum's the worst of the lot with a 70% mortality. 
and the comparative frequency of wounds of different viscera in 965 cases showed that small bowel and large bowel were really leading the way in these wounds. Wounds of the small bowel and large bowel comprise 60% of the total number of penetrating abdominal wounds. Now, small bowel wounds carried both the best and worst prognosis. If they were uncomplicated, and by that I mean if they were involved holes in the small intestine without any damage to the mesentery carrying the blood vessels to the bowel, they had a better prognosis than other abdominal wounds. But complicated wounds of the small intestine involving the mesentery resulted in the highest mortality figures for penetrating abdominal wounds. Large bowel wounds were dealt with by exteriorization and colostomy, and those sneaky retroperitoneal wounds that leaked into the retroperitoneal area were particularly associated and particularly dangerous for uh, sepsis. And here is the sort of bottom line, if you like, for work done by Wallace and Fraser. Uh, reported in 1918, surgery at a casualty clearing station. They had 2,127 patients with penetrating abdominal wounds. 420 of those patients were so moribund that they really weren't fit to undergo surgery. They were put aside to die. The percentage mortality excluding the moribund cases was 50%. And the percentage mortality, including the moribund cases, was 60%. And this is where Fraser's figure of 60% came from. If you subtract 420 from 2,127, you're left with 1,707 cases which were considered for surgery. Now, they decided that in 102 of these patients, surgery was not necessary. This may, for example, have been a piece of shrapnel penetrating the upper right quadrant of the abdomen, causing bleeding in the liver, but the pulse of the patient subsequently was settling down, and so the indications were that bleeding was stopping. So these patients would not undergo a laparotomy. So 102 patients, surgery not thought necessary. That left 1,605 patients who did have a laparotomy, and the total operative mortality in that group was 53%. Now, I've already said that the proximity uh, to the chest makes combined injuries of the chest and abdomen relatively common because only this thin muscle, the diaphragm, separates the contents of the abdomen from the lungs, heart, and the chest. Here's a patient with a combined wound of the chest and abdomen. Uh, this is a stab wound. Entry wound here, exit wound up there. And that's the sort of exposure required to cover all your bases in this wound. There's a hole, a large hole in the diaphragm, and the, star, the, 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 the knife has gone in front of the heart and surprisingly hasn't done any damage to the vessels at the root of the neck. But that's the exposure required. Now, Fraser found that combined wounds of the abdomen and chest occurred in 12% of predominantly abdominal wounds and 8% of predominantly chest wounds. And the results of surgical treatment showed their learning curve between 1916 and 1918 because the mortality from a combined wound was very high, and the recovery rate was only 18%. All the rest died. By 1917, the recovery rate of combined chest and abdominal wounds was 49%, and by 1918, it was 67%. So they're getting better all the time. And Fraser and Wallace's regime for treating and dealing with thoracic abdominal wounds was that if the thoracic wound was very small, it was disregarded and attention paid to the abdominal wound immediately. If there was an open wound of the chest, if there was a spirit of distress, then the chest had to be dealt with first. 
And in all other cases, the abdomen was dealt with first before attending to the chest, and then the diaphragm repaired if it was possible. Now, improved anesthesia certainly helped, resuscitation techniques certainly helped, and that included blood transfusion, and they all contributed to success. But blood transfusion in 19... 14, 18, well, started in 1917 in the forward areas, they were transfusing about one pint of blood, no more. Not very much, but enough in some patients who are fit young people to just tip the balance in favour of survival as opposed to dying. So here we are back at Brand Hook, just five miles uh, west Ypres. And Bowlby produced, uh, pushed a group of three casualty clearing stations to within five miles of the front line in response to the mounting evidence that early surgery brought benefit. So casualty clearing stations 32, 44 and Australian 3 would deal with all those wounds involving abdomens, chests and femurs because femurs also had a very high mortality. 70 to 80% in 1914, 1915, reduced to less than 20% by 1917, thanks very largely to an Aberdeen surgeon called Henry Gray. Advanced dressing stations closer to the line evacuated soldiers with these wounds quickly to the three casualty clearing stations at Brandhook. So there are the 10 advanced dressing stations strung out along the Ypres Ezer Canal. There is the town of Ypres, and there is the position of the front line at the start of the Third Battle of Ypres, where the British 5th uh, and then 2nd Armies pushed out, ostensibly to reach um, Ostend and Zeebrugge, and in fact got bogged down in the mud at a little village just five miles from Ypres called Passchendaele. One of the advanced dressing stations was Essex Farm. It's the only one that survives to this day. This is a painting done in 1917 and shows a soldier, I say, with an abdominal wound being loaded onto an ambulance wagon. I don't know if it is or isn't, but we'll say it is. And that's going to take the casualties back to Brandhook. And that's Essex Farm Advanced Dressing Station today. Not much changed from 1917. And it was here in 1915 when the Canadian First Division was in the line during the Second Battle of Ypres that a Canadian doctor, John McCrae, penned the lines in Flanders fields, the poppies blow, between the crosses row on row that mark our place. And in the sky, the larks still singing bravely fly, scarce heard amidst the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved. And now we lie in Flanders' fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders' fields. A motor ambulance wagon could take a patient with a penetrating abdominal wound back to Brandhook in less than one hour. The ambulance wagon was heated with a heat exchange mechanism from the exhaust. The patient was supplied with hot water bottles and blankets. And the casualty was delivered in the best possible condition to the casualty clearing station, where he would be operated on by teams of experienced surgeons and anaesthetists and experienced theatre sisters. And at a time of a big push, there would be something like eight or ten operating theatres functioning. Some from the casualty clearing station 
per se. Others from casualty clearing stations in other parts of the front where it was were quiet. Some from sections of a field ambulance and some from base hospitals. They would pool all the resources but get surgeons with experience in the management of abdominal wounds. Now, while the transport of the wounded from an advanced dressing station to a casualty clearing station was reasonably predictable, getting them back to the regimental aid post from no man's land was not. This is the British front line from the 1st of July 1916, the first day of the Battle of the Somme. And here it is again. You can see the British line there. The German line is at the bottom of the hill. You can just see sort of little bits of elevation there, just in front of those trees. And the bit between is no man's land. Now, the Battle of the Somme was fought on a 12-mile front, and on the 1st of July 1916, there were 57,000 casualties, 20,000 of whom died. And continued fighting round the casualties prevented evacuation. And soldiers wounded at 07.30 on the 1st of July lay out all day where many of them died because they simply could not be evacuated. And they weren't buried until after the 13th of November 1916 when the 51st Highland Division finally captured Beaumont Hamel. The speed of evacuation from a regimental aid post to an advanced dressing station was also unpredictable. And here you see uh, stretcher bearers from the field ambulance taking a wounded soldier back through the mud in the third battle of Ypres and it's taking one, two, three, four, five, seven men to carry one casualty back and they're up to their knees in mud. And there was often dangerous ground between the regimental aid post and the advanced dressing station. This photograph was taken early in 1917, August 17, during the first phase of the Third Battle of Ypres, which was called the Battle of Pilkham Ridge. But what was it like at Brandhook all those years ago? What was it like for the people who worked there? Catherine Luard of the Queen Alexandra Imperial Military Nursing Service left diaries and letters which have been published in a book called Unknown Warriors. A remarkable woman. She was in charge, sister in charge of Casualty Clearing Station 32 at Brandhook. She wrote, 27th of July, 1917. Hospital has just been pitched and already is splendid. This venture, so close to the line, is in the nature of an experiment in life-saving to reduce the mortality rate in abdominal and chest wounds. Hence, this advanced dressing station to which all such wounds come from a large attacking area, instead of going on to the rest of the casualty clearing stations six miles further back. Sir Anthony Bowlby turned up today. It's his pet scheme. We have 15 theatre sisters, 33 in all. Our 30 medical officers include the largest number of FRCSs ever assembled. July 31st. Now that's the first day of the Third Battle of Ypres. At 6.30 a.m. we began taking the first cases. 11 p.m. We have been working in the roar of battle every minute, going at full pitch. Twelve teams in the theatres. I thought the work was going to get the upper hand of us. We get cases an hour after injury. Which is our raison d'etre for being here? August 9th. Number 44 CCS is to open tomorrow. And as 35 sisters and lots of teams. The Australians are at present working with us. 
We are now to take alternate 50s of abdomens and femurs. August the 10th. Sir Anthony Bowlby came round today and seems pleased with it all. August 13th. The Australians open their own unit tomorrow. And we three CCSs take it in batches of 50 each, abdomens, chests and femurs. August 16th. Bombs dropped on the Australian casualty clearing station. Two killed. The Brant Hood casualty clearing stations were only five miles from the front line. There were British batteries close by, and these batteries were justifiable targets for German artillery. And so the casualty clearing stations at Brandhook were shelled from time to time. August the 18th, the letters to relatives of died of wounds reaches 400 in less than three weeks. Now, one of those who died and is buried at Brandhook New Military Cemetery was Captain Noel Shabas, VC. He was a regimental officer for the 10th Battalion Kings, a territorial battalion called the Liverpool Scottish. He won a military cross at a place called Hoga, which was a terrible place not far from Ypres, out on the Ypres salient. On the Somme in 1916, he won a Victoria Cross on the 9th of August, when the Liverpool Scottish were attacking a little village called Guillemont. Chavas went out into no man's land under constant fire, and one after another after another brought the wounded back to his regimental aid post. And when he had finished bringing back the wounded, he took the dog tags from the dead so that at least the people back home would not hold out any false hope that their son, husband, father might still be alive. Now, at the start of the Third Battle of Ypres, Liverpool Scottish were very much involved and Chavas was badly wounded. He did pretty much the same thing as he did in 1916, going out after his men. He needn't have done so, but bringing the wounded back. He got a glancing blow from a piece of shrapnel, which probably fractured his skull. But he carried on. And rather ironically, he had made his regimental aid post in a German blockhouse, which the Liverpool Scottish had taken in their advance. And the door of that German blockhouse was facing towards the German positions, it was facing the wrong way. And Chivas was resting in his regimental aid post when a shell came through the door, exploded, killed everyone else in the regimental aid post, and Chivas sustained a penetrating abdominal wound. He was taken to casualty clearing station number 32 on the 2nd of August. His ileum was perforated in many places. I don't know what his mesentery was like. He died, presumably of septicemia, on the 4th of August, 1917. So there is Chivas's grave in Brandhook New Military Cemetery with two Victoria Crosses. Only man to win two VCs in the Great War. The citation reads, though severely wounded early in the action whilst carrying a wounded soldier to the dressing station, Captain Chivas refused to leave his post and for two days not only continued to perform his duties but in addition went out repeatedly under heavy fire to search for and attend to the wounded who were lying out. This devoted and gallant officer subsequently died of his wounds. There are two other WBC holders. The first is Arthur Martin Leake. He won his first Victoria Cross in the Boer War and his second Victoria Cross in the First Battle of Ypres in 1914. Chivas was taken through his advanced dressing station on his way back to Brandhook. And the second in the Second World War was a New Zealand soldier of the Canterbury Regiment 
uh, called Charles Upham. He won his first VC in Crete and the second in the Western Desert. Now back to the story at Brandhook. August the 22nd, a very bad day. Big shells coming over. One burst between our wards and number four and killed a night sister asleep and knocked out three others. The quartermaster general was there and said, all must clear out, patients and personnel. And so the Brandhook casualty clearing stations were transferred further back to the town of Popperinga, uh, further to the west of Ypres. And that was the end of the Brandhook experiment. The girl who was killed was called Nellie Spindler, and she's buried at Lishenhook Military Cemetery uh, near Popperinga, where there are 10,821 burials. Only 21 are unknown, which is unusual for the Western Front, unusual certainly for Ypres Salient, because all the men who died here, and one woman, uh, were known. And, and uh, most of them died of wounds at the four casualty clearing stations at Brandhook. When you and I are buried with grasses overhead, the memory of our fights will stand above this bare and tortured land we knew ere we were dead. The grasses grow on Vimy and poppies at Messine, and in high wood the children play, the craters and the graves will stay to show what things have been. Though all be quiet by daytime, the night shall bring a change, and peasants going home shall see shell-torn meadow and riven tree and their own fields grown strange. They shall hear live men cry, shall see dead men lie, and hear the rattle of Maxim's fire, and see by broken twists of wire gold flares light up the sky. And in their new-built houses the frightened folk will see pale bombers coming down the street, and hear the flurry of charging feet and the crash of victory. This is our earth baptized with the red wine of war. Horror and courage, hand in hand, shall brood upon this stricken land in silence evermore.